laundering money and soliciting and viol uh, soliciting I'm sorry and violating sanctions to aid the Russian oligarch Oleg Deripaska. Joining me now is NBC Justice and Intelligence correspondent Ken Delanian. Uh, this is a fascinating uh, indictment, Ken. Not just one, but two cases filed against McGonagall today. What more can you tell us? Yeah, Ryan, this is an extremely serious and troubling case against a former senior FBI official. He, he, Charles McGonagall uh, rose to the level of the top counterintelligence agent uh, at the, in charge at the New York field office, where he his job was to protect the United States from foreign influence. But these twin indictments charge that he was complicit in foreign influence in two separate cases. First, while he was in that job in 2017, 2018, the indictment says he took $225,000 in cash from a former member of the Albanian intelligence service and went on foreign trips with this person and met other foreign nationals, all of which he hid from the FBI, failed to disclose, engaged in conflicts of interest, even got this person hired as a confidential FBI informant. And then this separate case in New York says that, as you said, McGonagall helped this Russian oligarch, Deripaska, who has close ties to Putin, helped him try to launder money and evade U.S. sanctions. Even though he had investigated Deripaska when he was in the government, he had access to classified information about Deripaska. So FBI officials are viewing this as a huge betrayal. Charles McGonagall's lawyer is saying that he is going to plead innocent and that he looks forward to seeing the evidence in this case, Ryan. Uh, and just quickly, remind us uh, about Oleg Deripaska. He's already facing sanctions from the U.S. Treasury, correct? That's right. He was indicted earlier this year on charges of evading sanctions. He is one of these pro-Putin oligarchs. He appeared at this propaganda news conference that Putin had with a bunch of oligarchs in support of the war in Ukraine. Um, he has been on the, in the crosshairs of the FBI for many years, and now he is under indictment as well. Right. Reads like a spy novel, but it is uh, real life as it gets. Ken Delaney, thank you so much. And up next, inside, Poland's push to send tanks to Ukraine as a bipartisan group of senators calls on the United States to do the same. It is not like a spy trail. It is a spy trail, especially with the controversy going on right now between the United States and Russia. And as we get further into this deal with Russia, we're going to see more and more people, and possibly may even be Donald Trump, I don't know, towards seeing where various, I guess you would call it under underhand, under undertow uh, readings, hang on a second, back up, uh, towards basically doing fi major finance deals over in, uh, the beginning. over in, in the Russian territory, you're going to find a lot of different ones that has their hands dirty. And that's one reason why the Walmart, Burger King, um, Basically, all the major McDonald's, basically all the, the uh, major uh, hospitality uh, people have have gotten out of there. Because whenever you have a conflict like this, um, there could actually be espionage charges placed up onto your life. And the last time I looked, uh, if you're engaged in a espionage uh pursuit on, on basically on siding up with the enemy in some sort of way that could actually be life 20 years to life or at the worst case scenario towards actually a death sentence especially if it's in the time of actual war under the Patriot Act and that just goes to show you how un intelligent that Donald J. Trump is because whenever that ordeal first broke out over there with Russia and the Ukrainians, one of the first things he spoke of was, wow, he automatically wanted to put Putin on this pedestal towards being a genius, even though he's over there massacring people left and right. You know, it's one thing to have, you know, collateral damage whenever you choose a certain particular target and you miss the target or the missile goes stray and you and you unfortunately hit areas that you wasn't planning on hitting. That's one thing. But the way that guy's doing it, he's deliberately trying to genocide 
the people over in in the Ukrainian area. And that's that is a big, big, absolutely one thousand percent no no. So I'm pretty sure. Uh, let's let's get to take on this next deal pertaining to this same guy, but they have captured basically red-handed with, with with his hand in the cookie jar towards doing what he was doing. And what makes it even worse is that he was doing it under the guidance and under the leadership of what what I believe to be the FBI. Let's listen. But the former top FBI official arrested on charges of money laundering. <laughs> of violating Russian sanctions, and of illegally making money while he still worked for the FBI. This is Charles McGonigal we're talking about, the former head of New York's... I, I guess he wasn't smart enough to get enough offshore accounts to be able to deviate from this for some reason, because if he was smart, like the rest of the crooks out there are, they have a way of taking their money and, and laundering it. It's called laundering, or burying it, in other um, offshore accounts. And basically, if you know what you're doing, which I don't know how to do it, I don't want to know how to do it, but I'm sure it wouldn't take much to figure out how to do it, towards taking that money and diverting it from whatever uh, currency that you was dealing with at that time in that particular country and rolling it back over to basically cash currency and then putting it in a suitcase and bringing it to the United States. You know, a lot of people just within the past 20 plus years, your, your, your bigger legitimate people like your dealerships and stuff like that. It used to be common back in the 60s and the 70s and even, even basically throughout the 80s where somebody would come with a handful of cash, you know, 15, 20, $25,000 and lay down on a brand new automobile and walk out uh, with the title in hand. Today, you walk in a dealership with $40,100 bills in a suitcase, and odds are they're probably going to, if it's a legitimate dealership, they're probably going to wind up calling the authorities in on you because anything over $10,000, if I'm not mistaken, it's supposed to be documented through Homeland Security. Whenever you take out a certain amount of money out of your account or you in access to that kind of money uh, because it can be looked upon as being drug money or illegal money like this guy right here was involved in doing. That's the whole purpose that Homeland Security tries to put a damper on, on that type of activity. That way, if somebody was to walk into a dealership with 40 or 50, $40,000, $50,000, dollars $100 bills, uh, odds are they probably wouldn't be able to buy an automobile with it. Now, if they wanted to take it down to a local bank and get it processed and then come back with a check, that would probably be acceptable. But as far as walking into a legitimate dealership in America or any company, as far as that goes, and offering that type of cash, odds are not only are you going to be rejected, odds are they're probably going to call the police on you. Odds are. Head of New York's counterintel office. He was arrested over the weekend. Among the allegations, accused of working with a Russian oligarch after he left the FBI in violation of U.S. sanctions. But we're also learning today that while working at the FBI, while still there at the agency, he also allegedly accepted more than $200,000 in cash from a former foreign intelligence official. Is it now, see, if that foreign intelligence official cared about his connection, they wouldn't have set it up that way. They would not have never set up that type of deal to where it was going from cash to hand. But obviously, they have become so lax up there in the White House that various people think that they can just do whatever that they want to do and ain't nobody going to catch them or it ain't going to be questioned on why they're doing it and who they're doing it with. Uh, to the point that now this guy right here was basically caught red-handed. And I, 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 you know, whatever he has done in legitimacy to the crime, I hope that he has to pay every day in jail for doing what he has done. Especially knowing that it was looked upon as a, a betrayal 
of an individual that was working for the United States FBI that would actually do something like this on the sidelines. I mean, we think Martha Stewart done something wrong whenever it comes to inside trading that she wound up having to go to jail over, in which inside trading goes on just about everywhere. It may not go on quite as blakely as what Martha Stewart done it as. That's where she got hung up in, in the deal at. But when it comes to inside trading, let's say you got a, a rich people coming over here from China and all of a sudden they're looking at the potential towards uh, the population and they're saying, wow, this is a good place to put in a, a, some sort of a shirt factory or, or, a, or a parts factory for, for, for a car manufacturer. And they'll go usually to the town mayor. He's usually the one to talk to. And, of course, the town mayor gets all this information down and says, well, I'll get back with you later. In the meantime, the town mayor knows people that's got this type of property for sale. The town mayor gets in his automobile. He drives down the road. He makes a deal with the people that's got the land that if you'll give me a cut off of it, I'll be sure and put you on the top of the list towards them being interested in your piece of property. Then he makes a telephone call. He gets the investors to come back out there again. They do the deal. And the next thing you know, what does the town mayor get? He gets a cut underneath the table, illegitimately, but that's what they do in getting proceeds off of that particular deal. And in the meantime, what even adds insult to misery is that you'll have somebody like the governor that will say, okay, if you come over here, we'll allow for you to work and set up shop and not pay taxes for seven years, all, all tax free. Well, you know who pays for that? That $32 trillion that they've been stamping on to our national deficit here lately pertaining to a free-for-all in regards towards raising the cap on the debt ceiling. All kinds of underhand illegitimacies goes on, has been going on, and will continue to go on as long as they got cash circulating in the system that cannot be traced. I continue to keep emphasizing upon to that. No wonder we're $32 trillion in debt. It's not just the drug lords. It's not just the illegal immigrants coming over here working for half the price, digging potatoes and, and building houses and working in grape uh, wine uh, gardens out west. It's all the above. From prostitution to drugs to people like this, to people like Martha Stewart, to inside trading with the with the mayor or the or the governor. Uh, it, it, it goes on and on and on pertaining to the dirty legitimacy that has costed the American people not millions, not billions, but trillions of dollars. And like I said, I hope they stick it to this guy. I hope that they basically go in and, and whatever that he has gained, which that's what they usually do, they go in and, and basically uh, confiscate his bank account, confiscate his house, confiscate his cars, confiscate even the, the ring off his, off his wife's finger, uh, and usually, uh, or they're supposed to, take it, auction it off and sell it and put it, put it back into the pool, put it back into the... Uh, put it back into the system. I don't even know now if that even happens or not. I mean, you hear of these law enforcement agencies occasionally, they'll bust somebody with a half a million dollars or a million dollars in their automobile. And by and large, that money is supposed to go to the precinct of whoever has obtained that money to be able to better the benefit of the whole community and a lot of times, a lot of that money will wind up disappearing. Or there'll be a catastrophe. And the government will allow, or allot, a certain particular area, X amount of dollars, that here, we're going we're gonna to let you have this to rebuild. And then the next thing you know, crooks get in, into the pile. And the next thing you know, a lot of, a lot of that starts dibbling, dabbling. And, and what used to be $30 million now is down to only fifteen. 
I'm telling you, the hooking and the crooking has got to stop in America if we're going to be a self-sustainable country. And if it doesn't, and the only person that I know of that's got, got power to do this is the President and Congress. If it don't stop, we will no longer function as a self-sustainable country being 30 plus trillion dollars in debt. And I give the FBI two thumbs up towards catching this guy. I hope that they catch all of them myself because, you know, it's pretty obvious that all these people that own all these vacation homes and all these big yachts and, and putting all their nieces and nephews and everybody else through college and, and they live in these big conglomerate homes and drive all these big cars and, and you know, good well, they got big fat bank accounts. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kick out one name out there that I know of that, that's one of the biggest crooks as far as I'm concerned, and that's Dick Cheney. Dick Cheney went in an office, paid at $4 million. He was in there for eight years. He wasn't getting paid but $250,000 a year. But yet now whenever he leaves, he's valued over $40 million. Halliburton. He was the first ones that dove in on the pile of money down in the south whenever Katrina hit. Basically gouging the American taxpayers. In addition to what Bush and Cheney had going on, Bush would blow up a bridge and here'd come Halliburton towards building it back. Or they'd blow up this and here'd come Halliburton towards building it back. And we was paying to not only have the bridge blowed up, but we was paying to have the bridge built back. I can't believe that our law enforcement has let our politicians get by with this as, as long as they have without somebody raising a red flag to it. But that just goes to show you that money talks and bullshit walks. That's the old saying, money talks and bullshit walks. Well, whenever you got everybody that's dibbly dabbling in the cookie jar then it makes it twice as hard for agencies like this to walk in and throw handcuffs on somebody, even though they know without a shadow of a doubt that they're, that they're guilty. Because the money ordinarily is untraceable, especially if this guy would have done it right. He didn't do it right. Martha Stewart didn't do it right. There's other people that takes cash and they know how to... to uh, set up offshore bank accounts and laundry that money in and laundry that money back out. They do it every day. His attorney putting out a statement just this afternoon saying McGonagall will plead not guilty to the charges and that he's expected to be released from custody today at some point, that that is their expectation. I want to bring in NBC Investigations. I know this one person. There's no way of proving it. Plus the time to lapse is already done delayed now towards statute of limitations, but I know good and well he had something to do with a big amount of money that got taken over in O'Brien County. This would have been this would have been in the eighties. And um he was smart and he set on that money and he set on that money. He set on that money until finally he started releasing a little bit of it here and there. And yeah. That's basically what you got to do in addition to him going over, I think, to the Philippines or, or somewhere and buying a piece of property over there. And uh -huh. there, There's people that know how to hoodoo the system. And, and they're not dumb crooks towards walking up to somebody and holding them up on a street corner with a gun. No, 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 no. Hardly ever those people even exist anymore. It's the smart crooks. It's the crooks that now know how to go into the computer and hack into people's bank accounts and, and get your credit card number and basically buy a home or an automobile in your name or do something else. Those are the ones that are getting by and those are the ones that's causing our national deficit to even grow unproportionately even higher every day. Correspondent Tom Winter, who's been following this one story for us, and Tom, a lot of twists here. 
a lot of twists here. And basically what you have is the person who was formerly uh, charged with being uh, the person who oversaw counterintelligence investigations, some of the most sensitive investigations with inside the FBI, looking for potential spies, looking for people that are working on behalf of a foreign nation and a foreign adversary, being the person who ended up getting paid by one of the people that his office was being investigated. And of course, I'm referring to Russian oligarch Oleg Deripaska. He's somebody who's been under FBI investigation for probably about a decade now, Hallie. According to our reporting, he's somebody, and we're looking at uh, photos from October, or video rather, uh, from October of 2021 when we broke the story that his house, this home in D.C., which belongs to a relative but largely believed to belong to Deripaska, was searched by the FBI in connection with the sanctions violations investigation and perhaps other potential charges that that person right there, Oleg Deripaska, closely associated with Vladimir Putin, a veteran of the metal wars, which uh, was a war between a number of private individuals seeking to over, uh, overtake and run a Russian state-owned businesses after the end of the Cold War, a violent battle between those business leaders, I should point out, and then ended up forming at one time and for almost a decade, uh, the largest aluminum co uh, company on this planet, the largest aluminum smelter until a company in China overtook them. So this is a powerful businessman who had been under investigation at one point, banned from coming into the United States, and the very person who was in charge of the office investigating him, according to federal prosecutors today, was eventually paid by him to look into a rival oligarch. That just touches the surface of some of the allegations against McGonagall today, including the fact that he received nearly a quarter million dollars from a Albanian foreign intelligence officer at one point during his career, including while he was still at the FBI, an investigation led by the L.A. field office, Hallie, they say, to avoid any conflicts of interest. That's that's getting close towards espionage right there. It sure is. If they can prove that he was giving away sensitive or selling sensitive documents or material, that would be espionage. I don't know if they can prove that or not. But there's another thing that I've heard a lot, a lot of people talk about pertaining to foreigners, how that our foreign agents here in America open up their doors towards allowing for money people to come over to America and start their own businesses. And they'll promise them, give them basically a seven year lead way and not having to pay no taxes. And then long about the sixth year and the ninth or 10th month, they change over everything, the business over in the, uh, 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 a cousin's name or somebody else's name in the family. And they just keep it going. They keep it rolling. But yet now the American people has to pay all these tremendous amount of taxes while all these foreigners are getting by, sneaking by, towards not paying no taxes. So, I mean, whenever the American people stand up against what the corruption has been going on for the past 30 plus years here in America, they absolutely have a right to do so. And this is just one individual that has gotten caught red-handed, and God only knows the, the and they will, they'll eventually seek them out, especially those that's got any type of dealings with the Russian oligarchs or the Russian people in general, because this thing is getting tighter and tighter and tighter, um, and as it gets tighter, it's going to be more riskier, and as it gets more riskier, there's going to be more people that's going to get caught, and when they do, they're going to have to pay the ultimate price pretending to doing what that what that they have done and you know what I support our law enforcement towards going after these type of people you know just like Donald Trump hadn't paid taxes in how many years I mean I just can't believe how these people are that smart towards basically bamboozling the system but they are so what does that tell me? It tells me that the system needs to be reworked. The system needs to be reworked, just like the system of the Second Amendment. Second Amendment. Whenever the Second Amendment was was uh, put into play, they basically only had single shot musket um, guns to fire off, which would take a few minutes to reload it. Today. Selling them military, high-tech, advanced artillery and putting it into the wrong hands. We see what that 
can cause again and again and again. Just like the ATF that set up a, a sting on the Davidians down in Texas and in the play of their sting purposely entrapped them by selling them the very same type of Fast and Furious guns that I'm talking about. So, I mean, there has to be some sort of common sense about all this. And that's the part that is not playing in right pertaining to our government. That whenever something like this does occur, heck, I'm jumping up and down. Thank God that they got the guy. There's probably a thousand to one more out there just like him. It's doing the exact same thing. Thank you very much for that reporting. Let's take it back to Monterey Park, California, where that news conference with some local and state officials uh, is just now beginning. We're going to bring it to you live. Let's listen in. So many people across the nation. In fact, I just had a phone call with President Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris, who expressed their condolences for what happened and uh, will be expressing their condolences to the victims but we also have the honor of having Senator Alex Padilla here, who um, delayed his trip to Washington, D.C., just so that he could be here with us. So, Senator, if you could please say a few words. Thank you, Congresswoman Chu. I want to thank Chief Fleece, the Congresswoman Supervisor Solis, and frankly, all the city uh, community and regional leaders that uh, responded so quickly uh, after the tragedies of uh, Saturday night. Uh, it's important to be here today to walk through this uh, resource center for families and friends of the victims and frankly the community at large because it's uh, going to take a lot and it's going to take some time but we know that the community is resilient and the community will rebound. Uh, we are committed to working together not just to support the families and support the community but uh, to once again use this reminder of the epidemic of gun violence in America. Uh, while there's still a lot that we are learning about these particular cases, we won't jump to all the conclusions. We'll let the investigations and legal processes run their course. Uh, we do uh, take it as uh, a reminder of the urgency with which we need to strengthen our gun safety laws across the country. Uh, many of my colleagues have pointed out you know, doesn't California have some of the strictest laws and protections of any state in the nation? And that is true. And they have worked. And it is helpful. But when there's a patchwork of laws and protections to various degrees across states, then clearly there are vulnerabilities that can uh, impact any community in the country. And so for uh, the... Uh, individuals in the community here in Monterey Park, throughout the region and throughout the country that are living in slightly more fear today because of what's been witnessed. Uh, this is I would hate to know right now that I had children growing up, if I was back in my 30s or 40s, and I had a couple, two or three children growing up, going to school, I would hate to know what type of anxiety, relentless worry, that would probably be on a level of of torture that I would have to worry about my children every time they got on a bus not knowing if they was going to come back in sound mind and body I just can't believe the damages that has been done to the families here in America good sound decent people because of the lackness of our government and once more, it, it's proof is in the pudding that whenever an occurrence like this, a, a major big occurrence like this occurs, we don't never see nothing passed pertaining to new policy in regards towards Congress. And it's as if they're scared of their own people, scared of the NRA. Maybe everybody's so dirty they don't want to uh, bring out nobody else's skeletons, afraid somebody's going to bring out their skeletons on them. I don't know. But it's out of hand, and it's unfair to the sovereign United States citizens, especially those that have been here now for years and years and years, hundreds of years here in America, and to think that we got to deal with this on a day-to-day, everyday routine that hadn't been already addressed in the proper form, it, it, it just, it's asinizing in how 
that our broken system continues to keep failing the American people again and again and again. They want to take punches at their own people in doing bad stuff, but yet no, we'll just lower the borders and let just any and everybody come over here and do whatever that they basically want to do. We'll hand them a check and, and tell them that you got just as much rights as everybody else, even though they hadn't worked not one day to contribute to the system. Like I said, the American people, they got a, they got a reason to formulate some sort of a January 6th deal like happened two years ago. I don't agree with what happened January the 6th. And it's not so much that I don't agree with it. It's the way that they went about it that I don't agree with. They, they went about it in a hostile, violent way. And that's where we're supposed to be intelligent enough and grown up enough that we can sit and talk and we can debate and we can vote in the people that are going to make a change and vote out the people that's been part of the problem. But even that hadn't been going on because the majority of the people has been blinded. I've said all along that the people up in this Dresden courthouse in Weekly County, Tennessee, are only as good as the people that put them in office. And if you got a bunch of corrupt thugs that helped to put them in office, then basically you got the same type of law enforcement that's going to protect those people that helped to put those very people in office. It's the chain of reaction. Forever action is a reaction. And until you can damper it, cut it off at the bud, it's kind of like child, uh, child abuse. I was raised up in this area that it was considered taboo for anybody to make a telephone call and turn anybody in pretending how that they was treating their children. Well, I realized that long about, long about a few years ago, 20 and 17, whenever my brother and I discussed it about three little children across the road, and we made that telephone call. We made the telephone call to, to, to Nashville, Tennessee. We made the telephone call to Dresden, Tennessee, pertaining to our concerns about three little children. And instead of us being rewarded for that, we actually got punished. That tells you how demonic and how upside down and wicked and broken that the system really is. Instead of being congratulated and thanked by the people up in the courthouse that we took enough interest to even make a couple of telephone calls, I got charged for stalking and my brother got pushed off into an early death on account of it. Now, you don't think that those same people that's in, been engaged in all this, you don't think that they're going to give an account for all this one day? God won't be a just God if he don't. God the Father will not be a just God if, if those people don't stand in account towards putting my brother to a quick uh, unjust death at the age of 51. And whenever I say that, I'm talking basically to law enforcement that had the opportunity from the deputies on up that could have stopped it. But because once more, various people's in control of the neighborhood making the proper telephone calls to the proper people. Tables turned. Tables turned, and we was the ones that suffered on account of it. Towards trying to be the good Samaritan. More needs to be done. Uh, two final things. One, uh, no, another minute should go by without once again expressing our uh, condolences uh, and our prayers to the families of uh, the victims and of the survivors and the community at large. Uh, they should take heart in seeing their community leadership respond so quickly and work so well uh, together. Uh, and last but not least, to call attention to some good news. Uh, earlier this year, or excuse me, last year, Congress actually came together on a bipartisan basis. Representative Chu on the House side, myself on the Senate side, when we passed the Safer Communities Act, which does bring additional resources for mental health, does bring additional resources for crisis response for incidents like this. So it's part of 
our recognition that communities will need that support, not just in the immediate aftermath of a tragedy, but for the long term. But more needs to be done, whether it's on reducing uh, uh, the types of weapons that are found in communities across the country, access to those weapons, uh, even when it's lawful, uh, we cannot let mass shootings be the norm, not here in Monterey Park, not in California, not anywhere in the United States of America. And with that, let me introduce my friend and colleague, Los Angeles. Well, buddy, you're just about a day late and a dollar short, that's all I got to say, because for the past few years, it has become the norm. It has become the norm. And the reason why that it's become the norm is because we don't have nobody in upper levels of legislation pertaining to our Congress and and senators and, and the President of the United States towards making a difference. That's just like changing the currency. I mean, it would be just as easy to, to bring in green dye in the printing presses up in Denver, Colorado, as it would be to bring uh, purple dye or pink dye or some other kind of dye towards telling everybody that they got basically 90 days to turn in their cash. And if they don't turn it in within 90 days, any green money will no longer be accounted as being good money. Why don't they do that? Why can't that be a, a, a move towards trying to straighten out the, the dark market pertaining to the underground syndicate market that basically now, in, in lots of cases, is more, more, um, more profitable than working in a legitimate business? I'm going to tell you why they don't do that. Because they know that if they do that, it's going to cause such of a ripple, or they may actually affect either their cousins or their uncles or even their own bank accounts to the degree that now they're suffering the consequences because they can no longer deal with under-the-table green cash. It would be that simple in telling the American people, the world, that we're going to change the color of the dye. And we're going to start printing up this other color money. That way, everybody would have to reform. Some of them would reform to the good. Some of them wouldn't. Some of them would go back to doing the exact same thing as they was doing before. Some of them would, would you know, change the color in their own printing company uh, basement uh, counterfeit money making machines. And... and Go about it doing that way. But the real way of going about doing this, to straightening this problem out, is to create a digital currency where no matter what type of transaction occurs, it would be traceable. That would mean all restaurants, all the public in general, would have to take their telephone and use it as a a uh, cash register. They would have to use their cell phones as a cash register, and in doing so, every exchange, regardless whether it was somebody buying a goat, or somebody buying a lawnmower, or selling the lawnmower, or vice versa, that all those exchanges of deals would be registered and yeah, you might could who do the government uh, out of a few dollars and pennies and nickels. But then again, you liable to have somebody knocking on your door wondering how come that the uh, numbers don't tally at the end of the year. And I know whenever I say that, a lot of people are going to hate me for saying that. I know that. I know that. One of the things that I found to be as fair-minded as I have with anything is that the ministers up in Kentucky, by and large, has to keep a treasury that can be examined by their state government at any given time. They can walk in and check their books. They can walk in. They can see who's making the donations. They can see where the money is going towards the donations. They can... Uh, request towards well, what is the tally uh what what kind of money do you have in, in the in a church account and etc cetera, etc cetera. i don't think that they have that in every state and you know what that 
opens the room towards? Illegitimate preachers taking illegitimate money and using it for illegitimate reasons. That's what that opens the door for. In other words, we're going to open up a nonprofit and we're going to be able to be tax exempt for 10%. And because we take a sticker and put on it so and so and so and so ministries and we put a tag on our on our uh uh $150 yacht or, or our whatever that because of it that validates the fact that we are an actual non-profit ministry and we're out here trying to do good for the benefit of the people. That's bogus. These ministers that get on TV and brag about their jets and brag about how much money that they got to thank that our country is turned upside down the way that it is right now, pertaining to all the needs, it is not only an insult to our laws, but it's an insult to God himself. To think that these people are doing this illegitimately, that people has entrusted them with this type of treasury, and now they're not, they're not, using it for the benefit of the Lord towards clothing the the naked and, and feeding feeding the hungry and spreading the gospel and helping people out. That's what the treasury is supposed to be for. That's the Lord's house. Everybody's supposed to pull their money in together. And if you're doing it legitimately, like the people in Kentucky are supposed to be doing it, you won't have no problem with somebody coming in and looking at your books. You know, you're passing all this cash around. Everybody's putting cash in, in, the, in the offering plate. And, you know, who's to say at the end of the day, whenever they count it all up, whether or not their accounts are accurate or not? I think, if I'm not mistaken, and I'm pretty sure this goes on routinely, they just haven't caught in everybody, but there was a priest that was taking a certain amount of money out of the plate every week. He would take this amount of money out. And it was small little bits that he continued to keep doing. There towards the last, he wound up with a big bank account. Well, that's what got him busted, is that they got to looking into his bank account, and sure enough, he had stolen that money from the clergyman out of the out of the church. There was another incident that happened in south southern Illinois of a pharmacist that was taking cancer patient medication and instead of giving them the whole dose like they were supposed to be doing that the doctor was requesting, he would skimp and only give them about half. Well, what was he doing with the other half? Well, he kept saving it up, saving it up, saving it up, till finally he had a whole vow. This medication was worth thousands of dollars. Well, if you do that after a period of years, guess what? You got a million dollars in the bank. That's what got him busted. He had too much money in the bank that did not justify the type of position that he was working for even though he was working in a pharmacist, it did not justify the means in, in what was going on there. Just like Dick Cheney going in office being worth $4 million, but coming out of office in eight years being paid $250,000 a year, and now you're valued at $40 million. I don't know what he's valued now. I hadn't looked it up, but I'm sure these crooked, crooked people that do crooked, crooked things are going to continue to keep doing crooked, crooked things because that's what they're in business for. You know, they want to degrade Donald Trump, in which they should. They want to bring up Martha Stewart because of what she done, which they should. They want to bring up people like Tammy Faye and Jim Baker pertaining to the way that they who dude and and done wrong in in their finance um investments 
which they should. They should. But how many more people out there are doing the exact same thing? They're just a little bit more witty about it to the point that they just haven't gotten caught yet. Maybe that pharmacist up in southern Illinois should have had two or three bank accounts rather than just one. Or maybe he should have had an offshore bank account to where the people in, a, in here in the United States couldn't keep tally with him. But what actually got that guy caught was that they got to looking and there were so many people that was dying that was associated with these doctors that was giving out this radiation treatment. They got to investigating what was going on and the next thing you know, bingo, they found it. The very people that was issuing out the medication was not issuing out the proper medication. And if I'm not mistaken, they charged that guy for murder. I don't know if the trial has ever happened yet. I don't know if he's still in jail. Uh, you know, he ought to be, He, the, the, as far as I'm concerned, they ought to put him underneath the jail. Somebody like that. <clears throat> These constant acts of violence, you know, med Medicare, Medicaid, uh, the psychiatric community in coming together as a unit. All those things is fine and dandy towards counseling with people and trying to help them build back their lives after something like this has occurred. And the fact of the matter is this guy got, at the, at the beginning of his speech, he was commending the law enforcement for what kind of a good job that they'd done. The bottom line is this, they never would have caught, captured the guy if the guy didn't pop a cap in his own head or heart, or wherever he killed himself at. It never should have occurred. So once more, they're beating a the horse on the wrong end whenever they keep going to these methods. Oh, well, we got to have more money for for uh, mental health. Oh, we got to have this. Oh, we got to have that. Oh, we got to have this. Oh, we got to have that. Once more, you're beating a horse at the wrong end. These are the problems that has already been initiated by the Luciferian Lucifer that obviously are getting into these people, taking control of their lives, becoming demon-possessed, and getting out here doing the things that they're doing. I seen a thing this morning on, I think it was Fox News, where one of their reporters was on the subway, I guess up towards New York or Washington, and a bunch of teenage kids decided they was going to play this prank on this old man that was sitting beside them, and they were smoking a joint at the time, and they took out a lighter and and uh, hit the lighter over the guy's hair, and the guy's hair just woof, just like a, a, a can of gas or something going off, because hair is very, very flammable, especially depending upon what you got in your hair. If you got any type of hairspray or, or mousse or, or anything like that, depending upon what you wash your hair in. But the guy's hair lit up and the uh, reporter or whoever he was uh, spoke up about it. And the next thing you know, these teenagers beat the crap out of this guy. I mean, busted out both black, both eyes, busted ribs. Uh, I mean, beat this guy to a pulp. Why? Because that guy was trying to do the Good Samaritan thing. He seen them boys doing something that wasn't legitimate. He spoke up about it. And now all of a sudden the wickedness, the meanness, the, the evil in them now turned towards the very individual that said something about it. Whenever we're dealing with a society that's being run similar towards how our prison systems are run. Because that's exactly how our prison systems are run. If you're in jail... And somebody does something to somebody to the point that a bad, bad ordeal occurs. You're supposed to play like that you're ignorant, out of sight, out of mind. You didn't see nothing, didn't hear nothing. And whenever the officers, whenever the COs come in there to question everybody, well, I was asleep. Well, I was in the bathroom. Well, I was, you know, I, I was occupied. I was listening to my radio. I was doing this. I was doing that. And, and it's really ironic that you can have a pod with 40 men in it and occurrence take place where somebody's at the point of their death and nobody's seen nothing. Nobody heard nothing. Nobody's seen nothing. A matter of fact, in a lot of incidences, if the people that get into a brawl, if it's not too bad of a brawl, 
I've seen this occur to where whenever the CEOs come in, well, what happened to you? You got a bloody lip. You got a you got a a, a black eye. Oh, officer, I, I fell. I I had a I, I made a mistake a while ago, and I I fell into the wall over here. Covering up the wickedness, covering up the bad stuff, covering up the deal towards what had occurred. Whenever you have a society that's being run that way, not only is it unfair but it becomes a very, very dangerous, wicked society. Whenever it gets to the point that the good Samaritans, such as my brother and I, could not share our grievances pertaining to a couple that had three children across the road, to the point of contacting Child Abuse Center, to the point that we get penalized or punished because of it, then you're dealing with an illegitimate, broken system and once more the system is only as good of the converts that put them in power to begin with and and you have to look at society as them being converts anybody that's participating in the system towards voting and putting people in office they're basically converts you know they're 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 participating in the same in the same uh in the same thing it's kind of like a religion. Everybody's pulling together towards making their decisions. But the bad thing about it is whenever you have an illegitimate party that's now so strong that now everybody has become dirty, everybody has become illegitimate, then you have a system that's basically, I'm going to use this terminology, I know it ain't going to sound good, then you have a system that's basically throwing up on itself. And the reason why it's throwing up on itself is because of what Donald Trump talked about towards it being a rigged system. It's unfair. It's rigged. And in lots of cases, it's evil. It's demonic because the people that's got the money can now walk. But the people that has to rely upon civil servants pertaining to you being appointed a uh, attorney... To, to defend you, you're at your wit's end. And you basically have to take whatever that they shovel at you. And that's exactly what Johnson was doing up here in Dresden, Tennessee. He immediately started shoveling out the fact that Juby, I'll let you out. You plead guilty to a, to a uh, Class E felony? Yeah, I'll let you out. Well, see, I done already played that game up there in Hoppinsville, Kentucky. And fortunately, that attorney up there was um, good enough or smart enough that she got him to redact the charges. So by what Johnson done, by convincing me that I was a multiple offense off offender in committing the same crime again and again and again, that's whenever he come at me and convinced me, hey, you're a multiple uh, offender. You had this... Uh, stalking charge up here. Now you got this stalking charge down here. And because of it, you're a multiple offender. You agree to a Class C felony? I'll let you out. thing about it is, the charges got amended. They got taken down. It's one thing to be accused of something, and it's another thing for it to go on your record. It never went on my record as being a stalker because all I'd done was make two telephone calls to two separate individuals that work for the same outfit pertaining to LA and between the lakes that thought that they was going to be able to hoodwink the system once more, outsmarting the system. They'd done already thrown me before uh, the county uh, being studied by their doctors up in Four Rivers Behavior Center. Don already took me through the federal system being studied up in downtown Chicago pertaining to MCC by Dr. Dana. And once they hadn't done what they wanted to do to me, that's whenever they decided to go after me on a federal level using the name of Land Between the Lakes because it is a federal park, but then crawfished and turned it into a state affair like I actually was was um, targeting Lisa Hawkins and Gary Hawkins 
on an individual level. And I had no earthly idea who these people was. I still don't know who these people are. I don't want to know who these people are because anybody that participates in an activity, an illegal activity like that, there will be a special place for Gary Hawkins and his wife Lisa Hawkins in hell. Now he can put on all the big act that they want to towards helping the children and doing this for the leagues and helping this and helping that. I get on Facebook. I, I, I can see what's going on in other people's lives without going in through this long investigation, especially whenever people are so public about it. And maybe Gary Hawkins meant well. I don't know. Maybe Lisa Hawkins meant well. Maybe maybe they did actually have fear in their heart. But I guarantee you, it was Dwayne Camry and other law enforcement agencies that was working for the agency at that time that set them people up towards doing that. But once more, they're three times seven, and they went ahead and done it anyway. They drug me from Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, through about seven different states on a run that was about 3,000 miles before I finally got back to Kentucky with a worn-out ass after sitting on a van, uh, basically my butt without any type of, of padding or, or any of the above, being bounced around for 3,000 miles with about six or eight other convicts that was chained up in the same van, and occasionally they'd stop and they'd drop somebody off, and occasionally they'd pick somebody up. The van kept rolling. You know, one guy, whenever he was sleeping, the other guy was driving. While one guy was driving, the other guy was sleeping. They'd stop off and give us McDonald's. They'd stop off once in a while towards letting us use the bathroom. It was a transporting service. Transporting prisoners from one state to another. They do it every day. But it was the way that they done it and how they done it is what made it so raw. And I could have possibly lost every ounce of all my tools, my truck, my trailer, all my possessions pertaining to my records. I did lose my, the home that I'd rented out. I lost my job. Um, I lost my position in work. And I also lost almost a year in jail. That can't nobody give back. Once you lose a day that somebody has stole from you, you cannot regain that day back, just like the people that their lives have been taken. You cannot give them people back their lives. And some of them people may have had a really, really good life. Who knows? Some of them people may have been important people. They may have been scientists or doctors. They may have been somebody that was associated with something really, really good. Once you take them people's lives, you can't bring them people back. How come our government has set back and allowed for this to fester and to get this far out of hand? Something is going on with the United States government that I tend to believe that our government officials is no longer in control of our own affairs. Somebody is pulling pulling the wool over somebody's eyes and somebody else is calling the shots. Because our elected officials are not doing what they're supposed to be doing, which is part of the dereliction of duty. They should all, every one of them, be charged for dereliction of duty and they should go walk home immediately. Especially those that's been in power for any length of time toward being able to do anything about all this gun violence. They should go home. They should resign. They have failed the needs of the American people. Just like Tommy Moore. Whenever my brother brought it to his attention pertaining to an aggravated assault that happened out here on his own property towards a group of people that took his own gun, put it to his head, and the only thing that saved him was that the gun had a safety feature on it. My brother told me, he said, Juby, instead of you going to two funerals that year, you'd have went to three. I went to my brother's funeral. I went to my father's funeral. And both funerals with, was within about a, a nine-month period. And like David, my younger brother, told me, he said, if that gun didn't have the safety feature on it, he said, you'd have been going to three funerals within a 12-month span. And I'm thinking to myself, my God to think that this went up before the court and it was a gun that got brought up 
pertaining to the scuffle that to this day they still can't find. They found the clip, so they know there was a gun involved. But the gun is probably, who knows, floating around in somebody's house around here. I know where there's one gun that I bought legally, a 12-gauge Ethica, whenever I was living in Milan, before Homeland Security decided to blackball me and put me on some sort of a dark list to the point that now, if I was to try to buy a legal gun, I would immediately have a telephone call from Homeland Security. What are you doing trying to purchase this gun? What do you, what do you plan on doing with this gun? What I ought to do is set them up and go to every gunsmith shop that I can think of and purposely fill out the paperwork and act like I'm going to purchase a gun. That way I can screw with them on a day-to-day -day level. That's what I ought to do. Just like there's been times that I thought, well, why not take your phone and throw it in the back end of an 18-wheeler? That way they'll think that you went to California on a run on the back end of an 18-wheeler. In the meantime, you're still over here. Or set your phone up to where you're watching porn all day and they'll think that you're hooked on porn or something. You know what I'm saying? There's all kinds of ways that you can deviate from their idiocy towards what that they're doing versus what that they're not doing that they should be doing. And in lots of cases, they actually have different things set up to where it's an entrapment for the American people because the laws of the land on the other side of the pond may not be like the laws of the land over here. And if they catch you with the wrong kind of stuff on your telephone, guess what? You can go to jail for that. Especially if you're talking about children. You can lose your position. And whenever I was in jail, I couldn't tell you the amount of professors, teachers, people that had the wrong stuff on their computer. And not only did they lose their position, not only did they probably lose their marriage, but they went to jail. They went to jail for that stuff. So what we have here is a cluster you-know-what. And it's very obvious that our government has failed to people. Now, people like this is going to get in, involved, and they're going to try to share the empathy. And I'm not saying that they're not em, uh, sympathy and empathy towards these matters. I would be, especially if it was somebody right here local, and I know them. Especially if I had the job in protecting them, and I didn't. I would be tearing up, too, acting like that, that this was the worst-case scenario that's ever occurred in my community, which probably is to some degree but we keep seeing the same thing again the same song and dance once more they're beating the horse on the wrong end it's the spiritual warfare it's these demonic demons that the bible talks about that shall come down in great wrath in the last days and if we're not smart enough to, uh, to address these things, they're only going to constantly get worse and worse and worse. And sometimes I, I tend to wonder if maybe that's what a great deal of them want. They want it to get worse. Because I sure don't see them moving in the direction towards bettering it. If I, if I had, have, I would have already seen some sort of mandated federal uh, deal pertaining to all this home homegrown uh, terrorism and all these other things that's, that's going on towards bringing harm and hurt to people to people's lives and they want to question whether or not it's a hate crime whether or not it's a hate crime well when did you have to decide or when did you have to decipher somebody killing somebody if it didn't have something to do with a hate crime the only time that it's not a hate crime is that if the first person is trying to kill the second person and the second person gets lucky and shoots the first person in self-defense then it's not considered a hate crime then it's considered a defense crime you was defending yourself but other than that, it's a hate crime. Anytime you're going to try to destroy people's lives, it's a hate crime. We don't need politicians that's went to college, that's got a degree or diploma hanging on their wall, to tell us what the hell a hate crime is. County Supervisor, Hilda Solis. 
You have been listening to Senator Alex Padilla, uh, along with other officials, including Congresswoman Chu, for example, deliver remarks there, um, a bit of an update on what's happening in Monterey Park, California. I want to bring back in Josh Letterman. And Josh, uh, let's just recap in the last 30 to 40 minutes. We've learned some new pieces of information here, uh, including most critically that one of the people who initially survived the late Saturday shooting has now died at the local medical center. Um, despite their best efforts, this person was not able to, to make it, uh, which is a sign of just how tenuous the situation is, even 48 hours after the shooting itself happened. That's right, Hallie, and unfortunately, it's something that was not unsuspected given the uh, intense injuries uh, from gunshots that so many of those patients who were transported to the trauma center uh, had. But we have learned, as you pointed out, from authorities at the Los Angeles County USC Medical Center that one of those uh, patients they were treating has died, bringing the total number of fatalities now to 11. There is another uh, seriously injured person in that hospital, as well as two more who they say are recovering. We you know, there are additional patients in other hospitals who have been treated. Uh, but that is one of the biggest pieces of information that we have gotten just in the last couple of hours, in addition to some of these details from the police department uh, over in Hemet, California, about past run-ins with this suspect. And of course, we also, for the first time today, uh, have learned some of the identities uh, of the people who were actually killed, including uh, 65-year-old Mai Nan and 63-year-old Lilan Lee. Uh, as well as the fact that the remaining uh, of people who had died from that initial group of 10 uh, were all in their 50s, 60s, and 70s, Hallie. We are hoping to get even more information about uh, who they were, uh, what yeah. kind of lives they lived, and who their families were, so we can continue to tell their stories uh, to the American public. Josh Letterman, thank you very much. We're going to sneak in a quick break. More from here in Washington when we come back. Only going to hold us over until around June 5th, give or take TBD number of days. I want to bring in NBC News national political reporter Sahil Kapoor, who's joining us now. Key factor here is to do something potentially that could get the House Freedom Caucus on board. This is a group of ultra conservatives who made the debt limit a big part of this speakership fight. What's up behind the scenes? What can you tell us? Hallie, there are no serious negotiations going on behind the scenes about the debt limit. That's according to multiple senior Republican and Democratic aides. Uh, there is a, a standoff right now in which the White House is insisting paying the bills is not negotiable and Congress should simply raise it. Now, most Democrats, with rare exceptions like Senator Joe Manchin, are standing behind President Biden and saying, if you want to negotiate spending cuts, do it separately, but not as part of the debt limit. Just uh, moments ago, as you, as you played, Senator Chuck Schumer was on the floor demanding of Speaker McCarthy if you want to include spending cuts in the debt limit, show us the plan, show us a proposal. McCarthy has not done that so far. His posture at the moment is simply to uh, ask President Biden to have a conversation, to begin negotiations. And the White House has said they will talk to McCarthy about a host of other things that McCarthy expects to bring this up in. Now, one of the big problems is to uh, identify spending cuts, that can get politically painful because you have to point out what to cut and who's going to be a loser. Uh, one revealing moment came when our colleague Chuck Todd asked one House Republican Republican Nancy Mace what she would like to cut as part of a debt limit negotiation. Let's play what she had to say. If you have one thing you're ready to put on the table yeah. as a spending cut that you think both parties can accept? Well, I think, well, obviously no cuts to Medicare, or Medicaid, or Social Security. That's a non-starter for either side. Um, but otherwise, it's up to, I would lean on the agency heads. Now, one thing you didn't hear, Hallie, was any proposal from Congresswoman Mace about what to cut. This is where it gets complicated for Kevin McCarthy, because if Democrats uh, continue to refuse to play ball, he's going to have to find 218 votes in the House out of his small 222-seat majority to come up with a proposal to initiate negotiations and pressure Democrats to the table. He's going to have to balance the wishes of moderates like uh, Congressman Brian Fitzpatrick, who say default is not an option, that the country right. has to raise the debt limit uh, one way or the other. There is also, you know, free Freedom Caucus members like Chip Roy, who are demanding uh, aggressive spending cuts, aggressive budget cuts, and others like Andy Biggs, who say the debt limit shouldn't be raised at all. How McCarthy squares that circle is far from clear. Uh, it's going to be a huge challenge for him. And at the end of the day, Hallie, his big task might be more about getting the Freedom Caucus to stand down and not try to retaliate against him, because w whatever McCarthy gets through the House is going to have to pass the Democratic-led Senate and get signed into law by President Biden. All 
likely by June 5th. Sahil Kapoor, thank you very much. Good to see you there. Uh, let's go from the House side to the Senate side with a tie to the House side, because Arizona Democratic Congressman Ruben Gallego is ending weeks of speculation today, officially announcing he will run for Senate in that state, setting up a possible showdown with the state's current senator, one of them, Kirsten Sinema, for her seat come 2024. Now, Sinema hasn't said yet if she's going to go for re-election or not. We remember she left the Democratic Party to become an independent ahead of the next general election. I want to bring in NBC's Vaughn Hilliard for more on this. Um, Gallego and his campaign announcement that is now official. NBC had been reporting this for several days now that he was expected to announce. He said the problem, and I'm quoting here, he said the problem that isn't that Senator Sinema abandoned the Democratic Party. It's that she abandoned Arizona. Talk through the dynamics at play. Right. Democratic groups were already going to have a difficult map in 2024, Hallie. And now Arizona becomes even more difficult because for like the Democratic Senatorial Committee, do you stick with independent Kirsten Cinema, who is a key figure in the bipartisan infrastructure package, the CHIPS Act, uh, you know, played that bipartisan role, though oftentimes she frustrated national Democrats from refusing to increase the corporate tax rate as part of Build Back Better. This is a dynamic that is really difficult because now you got a Democrat who is running, Ruben Gallego here. And of course, when you look at the optics of Arizona. It is still, most folks that I talk to in Arizona will consider it a conservative state. When Democrats have won over the last four years, it's been by narrow margins here. And there is a series of Republicans who are looking to jump in. Yes, the likes of Carrie Lake and Blake Masters, but also more individuals like Karen Taylor Robeson, who narrowly lost to Carrie Lake for the governor's race last year. And she's somebody who is much more aligned with the likes of a Doug Ducey. Uh, some of her former advisors were McCain advisors. And she's looking to jump in this race, I'm told, as well. Here. And so now you're looking at the prospect of a potential three-way race here, and it's going to be a decision point. Of course, Ruben Gallegos made his decision, but now it's going to come down to Kirsten Cinema. Is this a bid that she wants to take on uh, as part of a re-election campaign? There's a lot of question marks that folks in Arizona are now wrestling with, as well as those national ones. Do you weigh in ahead of August of next year? Do you weigh in in November? These are tough conversations that are now taking place, and there's a long runway for those conversations to continue, Alec. Vaughn Hilliard, thank you very much. I want to take you back to our top story now, because in just the last few minutes, we've heard from Attorney General Merrick Garland about that shooting in Monterey Park, California, that has left 11 people dead. Here's what he said. I want to express my deepest condolences to the community of Monterey Park and to the families and loved ones who are grieving an enormous loss today. FBI and ATF are providing all support possible to our state and local partners, and they will continue to do so. All of us at the Justice Department are committed to doing everything in our power to protect our communities from gun violence. I want to bring in now the mayor of Monterey Park, Henry Lowe. Mr. Mayor, thank you very much for being with us this afternoon. I know it's another difficult one for you. Thank you for having us here, and thank you for uh, your sympathies. Of course. How are you doing? Let me just start there. Um, you, it's been about 48 hours now. Um, a lot of people around the country are thinking about you and about about your neighbors. So, oh, thank you so very much. Um, it's been um, probably just a tragic time for our community, and I think many of us are still in disbelief that this happened, especially during uh, the weekend of Lunar New Year, um, in which uh, the city. Um, held its Lunar Year Festival um, um, near the site of the um, shooting. Uh, and this is after a three-year hiatus in which we were unable to uh, hold uh, this festival because of COVID. And so, um, you know, but during the Lunar Year Festival, you know, one is hopeful for the future and certainly um, to see, uh, you know, this happen is just been very disheartening. To say the least, um, I know that there has been some discussion, and I know that you are aware of this too. That because one of the key questions for law enforcement here has been motive as to why this shooting happened. There's been some dis discussion right. that perhaps this attack may have been linked to some kind of a domestic dispute between this alleged shooter and his ex-wife. What else do you know about that? What else can you tell us on that front? You know, um, right now um, we are still trying to determine the motive. Um, I know that's. Uh, part of the um, ongoing investigation, um, and that's uh, what we understand at the moment. 
there is also, I think, discussion around the, the fact that this could have been as, as horrific as it was, perhaps even worse, were it not for the actions of a heroic member of your community who basically wrestled <coughs> the gun away from this alleged shooter at a second location on that Saturday night. Brendan Say, have you had a chance absolutely, to speak uh, with him? Absolutely. I have not um, had the opportunity to speak to him, but so I can say that yes, um, um, this individual, the two individuals, are heroes and uh, probably prevented um, a, what could have been an even bloodier uh, uh, event. And I also want to take the time to thank our own uh, police officers uh, who responded mm. with the three minutes of the first 911 calls, as well as our <coughs> uh, fire and paramedics who rushed to provide aid. And they may have had. And I'm not degrading any police officer pertaining to the first responders in their job and what they do. That's not where I was going with with all this. <coughs> where I'm going with all this, they talk about motives. They talk about a hate crime. The motive is evil. Unless <coughs> it was an act of passion where you walked in and seen your girlfriend or your boyfriend or your wife or your husband... <clears throat> involved in a sexual act and, and you lost your head and, and you didn't uh, think it through and you wound up picking up something and killing somebody. <coughs> That's considered an act of passion. That can be looked upon as being manslaughter because of that. Other than that, it's hate. It's evil. There's no other way to put it in no other frame of reference with a motive, just with somebody Anybody that wants to commit harm like that to people, it's initiated by evil, hate. That's the motive. And that's the part that they're swinging at and missing it by three foot every time. And it's almost like I'm a broken record whenever these occurrences happen that I predicted that was going to happen. I put out an advisory in 2005 that I got punished for up in Davidson County pertaining to Homeland Security. Once more, it's been Homeland Security that's been trying to ruin my life since when? Since when? Since them nine tapes went to Ronald Reagan. And now it has backfired, not just on Homeland Security pretending Secret Service, but now it's backfired on the whole, the whole thing. The whole thing now is coming, coming unwound. And now the consequences are falling on everybody's everybody's lap to the degree that now everybody is feeling it some form or fashion. Maybe not as much as what these people just got through feeling it. But then again, you know, whenever you have fires and floods and, and deluges and $30 trillion in debt and all the drug overdoses and your son winds up getting hooked on drugs or your daughter gets hooked on drugs and she winds up having a child that the child's either deformed or mentally retarded because of the drugs or the child itself is hooked on heroin because the mother or the father was hooked on heroin then you got a problem that is coming home just like the walmart slogan coming near a neighborhood near you and that's the part that the people over in Kenton, Tennessee, as well as Weekly County, as well as state, as well as federal, regardless whether they be up in Kentucky or over in Oklahoma, that's the part that they don't get. They have been involved in something. They have been beating the horse at the wrong end. They was trying to attack the very person that was trying to help them, not hurt them. They know good and well that I didn't have no harmful intentions. Mr. Um, Burns, Lieutenant Burns in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, that's no longer, he's, he's retired U.S. Marshal, and now he works for the city council. I don't forgot now if it's Edmond or where it is. I think it's not Edmond, but it's some other town. He knows good and well that I did not have any intentions toward driving to Oklahoma and doing any type of bodily harm to that man. Just like Dwayne Camry knew that I didn't have no intentions whenever I said what I said to Dwayne Camry up here in the land between the lakes. And I feel like that that's the reason why 
that he jabbed me the way that he did, especially the third time by using Lisa Hawkins and Gary Hawkins, is because he he felt like that he had lost an opportunity towards sticking it to somebody. And the whole time, I never threatened Gary Hawkins. I never th uh, uh, threatened Lisa Hawkins. I never threatened anybody in the LBL Park Arena. I was trying to help them by telling them that God had showed me that there was going to be electrical disturbances. And what did they do with that? They tried to make me out to be a homegrown terrorist like I was going to produce the electrical disturbance. I have never seen a group of people that was so upside down beginning at the White House. Never in my entire life. And if they're not upside down, they're two-faced. They refuse to be honest. They refuse to come clean. And they're just letting this harshness fall upon to our society, our ever-loving communities and, and, and our country to the degree that I guess they're just determined that they're going to bring the whole ship down because they know that they're going down. They're going down thing about it is, I don't judge my government off the appearances of a few bad apples, regardless whether it be county government, state government, or federal government. I'm smart enough to look through that and realize what that they're trying to do, and which they have actually provoked a great deal of people in them people doing stuff that they shouldn't have never done towards attacking various officials because the people that was doing what they was doing was taking it out on the system. And it's not so much the system, it's the people that's working within the system that makes the system broke. That's what breaks the system. And whenever you have people like the President of the United States right now currently that refuses to get a handle on the money situation of the syndicate dark money market, well, you pretty well know who's ruling the roost. I mean, they won't even initiate towards mandating any type of federal laws or converting or um, conforming the Constitution, knowing that it was written during a time that they had only powder guns. They won't even reform that. So the people that we've hired to help us regardless whether it's county, state, or federal, are obviously too scared to do the proper and right thing whenever it comes to them working for the benefit of we the people. Now, whenever it gets to that state, according to the Constitution of the 17th Amendment, the right to basically create another government under that government, then is whenever you're fringing on that very thing occurring. But once more, it doesn't need to be done. If it is done, it don't need to be done in the form of violence, the way that the January 6th people tried to do it. It needs to be done up front. It needs to be done up, up open. And it needs to be discussed. And it needs to be... Um, dealt with appropriately and whenever it's all said and done with we can all make a vote towards the yeas and the nays and we can figure out how many people really want to change our broken system versus how many people are part of the problem to the system it's kind of like mike wilson being elected nine times for sheriff in the same county knowing good and well that he had his certain clonies probably in about six different areas in the county that he could depend upon. And these people was going to influence all the rest of the clonies. And once more, whenever you have a system that's operating the same as inside of a prison to where whenever something occurs, all of a sudden, oh, out of sight, out of mind. Or you have a system that will work for this one but won't work for that one. Or you have a system that want to make things twice as hard on this one towards giving them, let's say, the long dance towards making sure that they do all their time 
versus this one over here that don't hardly get no time. Whenever you have a system that's being run this way, then you have a Donald Trump broken rigged system. And that was Donald Trump's main objective in trying to get to the root of the cause. The only thing that he done is that he went about it in a bad, wrong way. And he knows it. He knows it. And odds are he's probably not going to confess to what he already knew because then he'll basically be incarcerating himself. So naturally he's going to plead the fifth. <clears throat> and and he's going to be... But does that not say something about Donald Trump's character? Sure it does. But do you think he gives a damn? Do you think Donald Trump gives a damn about his own personal character the way that he's going to foresee himself in the eyes of people such as myself? Absolutely not. You know why? Because he's still on the king of the mountain. He's still got the deep pockets. He don't have to depend upon nobody like a Juby. These wealthy, rich farmers around here, they don't have to depend upon somebody like a Juby. But they claim that they have to depend upon the very same God that I depend upon. So this summer, whenever it gets super, super hot again, and their crops start failing, and their Mississippi River starts going dry again, do not come knocking on my door begging for some sort of a rain dance. Because you're not going to get it. A matter of fact, I went so far as telling my son before he ever left to go to Denver, Colorado, which was give or take about somewhere around 2000 and 2013 or 14. It may have been before that. I think it was before that. Anyways, whenever he went out to Denver, Colorado, I told him, I said, that's the best thing in the world for you. He said, why is that? I said, because if things get as harsh as what I think they are here in America, I said, the odds are they'll try to get to me, and the way they're going to try to get to me is getting to you. I said, that's the way the mafia and the syndicate work. They'll go to you. And I'm telling you now, if they grab you up towards going to sacrifice you to get me to re uh, re-event or get me to uh, re-averge or get me to, to go along with their way, the worldly way, I said, I'm just going to have to sacrifice you. I'm going to have to sacrifice you, son. And you know what? I really give him credit towards him coming back to Tennessee. I really do. Because it took some boldness or it took some very, very blindness and ignorance in thinking that the words that I was telling him, that I was only blowing smoke. Because I truly believe within the next three years from now, things is going to get so bad here in America that obviously this Mexican standoff, we haven't made believers out of them yet towards the global uh, warming. We haven't made uh, believers out of them towards somebody being basically a messenger of God. We haven't made believers out of them towards climate deniers and, and uh, election deniers and, and basically Bible deniers. And because of it, I foresee the only thing that's going to happen is it's going to grow drastically, immensely worse. And I mean that from the perspective of a social level, pertaining to all these imbalances, pertaining to dangerous, living in perilous times. And I also mean that pertaining to irregular weather patterns that I know for a fact were causing a great deal of it pertaining to what we are doing to the planet Earth by draining all the precious resources out of the ground. Which, once more, it was the Luciferian Lucifer that blinded the people's eyes in thinking that they just had an unlimited amount of well that could just run forever. What did Jed Climate what did Jed Clement call it out in California whenever he struck gold? He said, it's gold. Black gold. Well, the black gold is now causing problems all over the world. Now, people that's in their 70s and 80s and people even in their 60s and 
Probably a lot of people in their 50s and maybe even some in their 40s are just like those other people. The blind lead the blind, and they still haven't been convinced yet that the world's actually warming up from the inside out and from the outside in. It's basically like a ping pong, a ping pong uh, scenario. I use that for, for an illustration, the ping pong scenario. What goes on on earth bounces up into the heavens. What goes on up there bounces back down to the earth. It's like a ping pong. It's, it's in itself, it's, it's a, uh, it's an entity of itself that was put in place, kind of like a tuned machine that's in perfectly tuned. And once you get that machine out of tune, well, then you start having hiccups. The ecosystem. It's an ecosystem that the earth creates towards sending out the heat and the rays from the earth up into the atmosphere. And it's an ecosystem that bounces back from the atmosphere back down to the earth. That in and of itself is an ecosystem. Just like our oceans is an ecosystem pertaining to the oceans coming in, coming out. It's basically like a like a washing, big washing machine. And then you got the, you know, all the other stuff that goes on that helps to cleanse the ocean that are basically now the corals are basically dying that are causing some more damages with our marine life. These are all ecosystems. The ecosystem pertaining to the big, the big animal, you know, depends upon the little animal. The little animal depends upon the littlest animal. And then you go down to the very ant, to the very bug, to the very gnat. It's the ecosystem. There's an ecosystem below our feet. And that ecosystem is being disturbed by draining all the precious resources out of the ground. They have been blinded to this. Who has blinded them? Lucifer. The physical Satan that's now over in Saudi Arabia that masterminded 9-11. Now people can play this off. And I know that they will. They'll play it off. They'll say, this guy has lost his mind. He's a troublemaker. He's trying to stir up trouble. Am I? Am I? By me putting out advisories of a bloody road ahead in 2005? Am I? By me putting out advisories in 2007 towards the major electrical disturbances? Am I a troublemaker? And I'm sure there'll be people that will be just as lost, just as deceived, and just as wicked in their heart towards wanting to believe that about me. That I'm either phony, fake, bogus. You know, they thought they, they basically treated Jesus as he was nothing more than a blasphemer. And the whole time, it wasn't Jesus committing the blaspheme. It was the rabbis. It was the holy men. It was it was the priest. It was those that already had a sense of belief about them that was falsely accusing Jesus of being a blasphemer. So that made the people that was doing the accusing of them being the blasphemers. Good luck to each and every one of us as we're going through more and more bloodshed, more problems, the debt ceiling, um, crooked people doing crooked acts, I mean, I could go on and on and on, it's, and, it, and it gets sickening towards me having to make these videos again and again and again towards basically being like a broken record. Deja vu all over again. Deja vu. Groundhog Day. Groundhog Day. Groundhog Day. Keep repeating itself again and again and again and again and again. Which a lot of your psychiatrists claim that that's an, uh, the, the proof of insanity of a person continually doing the same thing, but expecting different results from it. And the only way that we're going to change, we're going to have to change from the inside out. Just like Jesus said, if you're going to clean the cup, clean the cup from the inside, and the outside would take care of itself. Anything else is in vain. Probably only 1% of the people that go through Alcohol Anonymous are... Narcotic Anonymous actually come out of that, it may be 2%, come out of that to the point that they can say they've been delivered. They don't never have to worry about falling off the wagon again. The rest of them will be just like Groundhog's Day. 
जय शाह